Hey now, welcome to my video book version of Being One Owing That You're Not. This is the second book part of a trilogy, and each of the specific books in the trilogy have their own emphasis. The emphasis in the first book was that this is it. Anything that you ever experience, any place that you go, any country, any town, any dream, um, any heaven or hell or purgatory, out-of-body experience, astrodynamic, anything you could possibly experience in existence is right here. This is it. This space is the only place you'll ever be because it's the only thing that exists. Um, this emphasis from the second book is that it is and it isn't. And they're both existing simultaneously. The emphasis of the third book is the three aspects of awareness. Uh, what awareness is, what awareness does, and awareness appears as. All three of those are the three aspects of awareness, the triangle. So, the second book titled Being While Knowing That You're Not acknowledges the two truths that are seemingly paradoxical. You see very clearly that nothing exists not even you, while simultaneously the world appears. And here you are, being. The title also gets to what I describe as a nostalgia for now. It's a nostalgia for a world that still appears. When this first happened, and I'm not sure if I covered that in book one or if I'm gonna cover it in book two, but I did go through this before, and I felt like the world had ended. And I'm still awake, walking through a world that doesn't exist, taking in memories of a ghost world that doesn't exist but still appears. I have not had that feeling for about 20 years now. And after I just had it again at the end of 2019, I'm wondering if what I experienced 20 years ago was an individual death and what I'm experiencing now, perhaps shared by everyone on the planet, is a collective death. Like we're all on this one. Another important aspect of it is and it isn't is that it's about inclusion rather than exclusion. Acknowledging this hidden aspect or this unseen part of ourselves completes who we are and that's why I call it complete C. What I'm referring to is both aspects of ourself, the unseen aspect and the seen aspect. We have to include both parts to have uh, what I call complete C. Going through life, acknowledging both sides of the circle Awareness as an object or the world and awareness as the void or the source for the world of appearances. I found it very interesting this week that I finished book two 90 to 95% of the way, but I couldn't bring myself to complete it. I thought that part of my story was finished, but nature knew better. It was only after the dark part of the story was experienced that I complete that the complete story was ready to be told. Because it all needs to be included. And that's the only way we as a collective are going to get through this growth spurt that we're going through right now. We have to include it all. Everything is God. Everything. Literally and actually. So that is the introduction to the second book. So now I'm going to read uh, chapter one from Being One Knowing That You're Not. And I created a book cover. I haven't got a profession to do it yet, but what the book cover is going to look like is this uh, Being While Knowing That You're Not. And this takes into consideration simultaneously being and not being in your orientation to the world. So like I said, I'll, I'll get an artist to professionally do that, but at least wanted to include that for now. So we'll begin 
chapter one, being while knowing that you're not is the greatest joy. Um, this book is just like this, the first book. It's a collection of my journals that were written uh, anywhere from the late 90s to 2002 is where I left off in the last book. I left off August of 2002 in book one, and that's where I'm going to pick up. So the book is going to be uh, half my journal entries, and then the other half is going to be me uh, explaining or, you know, um, expanding on the, the journal entries. So it starts with me just giving a summary, and then after a couple pages, I'll get to the first journal entry in August. So chapter one, being well knowing that you're not is the greatest joy. Enlightenment is not at all what I expected, but that's a good thing. I had always regarded enlightenment to be almost fairy tale. -like. I don't think that I thought the enlightened could actually levitate or perform magic tricks, but I must have thought they would have a glow about them or something special would be added to them. Up until now, if I were to draw a picture of what I thought it would be like to be enlightened, I would first draw a picture of a normal person in a normal world to illustrate what it's like before enlightenment. Then in the next caption to illustrate enlightenment, I would draw a picture of that same person in the same world but glowing like he had a halo or an aura that extends yards away from the body. But now that I know what true enlightenment is, I would draw a completely different picture to illustrate it. I would still draw a picture of a normal looking person in a normal looking world to illustrate it. I would still draw a picture of a normal looking person in a normal looking world to illustrate what it is like prior to enlightenment, but to illustrate enlightenment in the next caption, I would, instraw, I would instead draw a picture of the same person yet shadowed out or erased and it would be the world that would be illuminated or shining brilliantly instead. That is the more accurate description of enlightenment. True spirituality is not about transcending the world and glorifying yourself. Instead, it's about transcending yourself and glorifying the world by recognizing that this truly is it. Okay, so now we get to the journal entries. Um, I'll start with 9902 because um, it was the first time that I wrote in a while. It's the first time I wrote in a while. So I write, everything seems to be happening outside of time. And there is so much that I want to express, but I don't know where to begin. August 29th seems to be a good place to begin, since I already journaled that day. And uh, incidentally, as you'll notice, as I'm writing these journals, you get the feeling I'm writing to a person. Most of the time I am. Most of these journals were written on uh, discussion forums where I was discussing these subjects with other people. So I'm actually talking to someone. Uh, as I'm writing this. All right, so uh, August 29th seems to be a good place to begin since I already journaled that day. So August 29th, 2002. This is nine days after the experience where I saw that I was the eye behind all eyes. So 829.02 I write, the intensity of what I expressed in that letter regarding enlightenment has been growing rapidly. And this whole weekend has been so profound that I could hardly contain myself. Thursday, we went to the fair, and the first ride I went on with my daughter sparked something that has been growing day by day. I am on this ride, and I immediately become aware of how wonderful it is to experience this. I've always ride, I've always rode the rides as Mark. But Thursday, in the absence of any sense of Mark, there was only the raw experience of riding that ride, and I was friggin' ecstatic 
that as a personal awareness, I could experience all the beautiful colors and lights that danced around me, the spontaneous songs of joy that blared from the loudspeakers, the rush of the ride taking me around and around at an amazing speed. Life is a celebration indeed, and I was so happy to participate in the many splendors that are offered in duality. I could feel my daughter's love as she kissed my cheek. I could appreciate her holding on to me as this was her first scary ride. I could express this joy to my wife. I could smile at others brightly and let them know that there is a deep connection that is rarely spoken of. Life has been nothing short of magical since Mark has yielded to God. Then on 8.31.02 I wrote, Today, on our ride back from the movies, I was so moved by the ecstasy of being and the celebration that life is that I spontaneously expressed an intense love for George Bush. I don't remember the sequence of events that led up to this, but we were all listening to some beautiful music looking at the incredible views that we have here in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I was expressing to my wife how awesome it is to be here participating in what we are. I saw all of life as a celebration of what we are and how bliss is nothing less than the expression of what we are. As I was pointing to the rolling mountains and the cows that were feeding on the earth, I got an impression of George Bush, whom I've always disliked and I immediately felt such intense love for him. I saw how scared he was and how all his motivations and actions are born from this fear, which made me that, more, that, made me that much more loving of who he is. The next day started out much the same. The joy that I have been describing is the deep appreciation for being while knowing that I am not. I had settled very deeply into the witness which could be described as being the space for everything. As the witness, I am the space for every single thing, included the world, and all of its many processes, including identification. It was around 5 p.m., and we were preparing dinner with our daughter, helping us in the kitchen. I had turned to my wife to give her a hug, and I was hugging her, I heard a loud crash. My daughter had tried to lift a pot of boiling water and she fell to the floor with a pot of water boiling all over her. She was screaming, my wife was screaming, so I knew that I had to act as opposed to react. All I could think was she's in pain, but we could cut down on unnecessary suffering if we remain calm. I wasn't sure if the burn was so bad to justify a trip to the emergency room so I called some urgent care facilities as I thought they could treat her quicker. So we rushed in the car, but did not make it in time to the uh, urgent care, so we tried the pharmacy that was nearby. As we were walking to the pharmacy, I saw that my daughter's eye looked very bad. It had burned off a layer of skin, and the whole area was bright red. At this point, we knew that she had to be taken to the emergency room. We lived near UVA, which is a top hospital, so they brought in the whole burn team immediately. After she saw the attending doctor, she saw a plastic surgeon and an ophthalmologist. We must have been there for four hours while she was getting checked out. This whole time, I was living from the witness or the void. Not by choice, but because this is all that remains. I took notice of this through the whole ordeal and the whole thing was seen through such sober eyes. I cried, but I was also the witness for, this, for the sadness. Well, I cried, but I was all the witness. I cried, but I was also the witness for the space for the sadness. I got angry, but the anger didn't last under the sober eyes of the witness. Amazingly, I also accepted everything as this was now the what is, the reality. This was also the perfect unfolding of reality. Sometimes it even seemed surreal, as if I was watching a movie, which is my life. And this part is where everything turns to shit to see how attached I am to that role and everything involved. 
I found that I was attached enough to be in pain, but unattached enough that I never lost my presence and awareness throughout the whole ordeal. In the end, they told us that the burns on our arm and stomach were second degree burns and should heal as well as a good sunburn. The ones on her eye, they were not so certain of. They were afraid of scarring, which would cause her eye to sag and maybe even demand surgery. So we were to follow up with appointments with the plastic surgeon. We told her daughter that everything would heal perfectly and we agreed to assume this for ourselves. We didn't tell anybody as we wanted to be as positive about this as possible until something was known by the doctors. Staying positive proved to be difficult as I had to be at work the next day and being away from her was very hard. The first couple days were okay as I was pretty stunned by the whole thing, but on Wednesday night, I was feeling a pretty deep pain and this brought about discursive thinking, which I had not been accustomed to. Guilt started coming in. Resistance started to build and I didn't even care to be present for it. I began to think that I was being tested to see how much I could take. I thought my daughter was gonna be scarred for life and this would always be a reminder of my negligence. I didn't want to do anything but wallow in my pain. Occasionally, I would stop to see if I could still remain present in awareness and I found that I could. But this didn't matter because while being present, I felt bliss or nothing at all but I didn't want to abide in that place. I really wanted to suffer. I felt attracted to the suffering, to this resistance of what is. This pain resulted in me getting a head cold the next day and I spent my last day at work getting sick. It was then Friday, so I was off for the weekend and I was really looking forward to spending time with my daughter. The dumbness that comes from a head cold sent me right back to where I was before I started indulging in suffering and resistance. I spent the day with my daughter, which made me feel very good. And after she went to bed, I sat out on my back porch reflecting on how much resistance I had been putting up the last couple of days. As soon as I simply allowed for that past resistance, it was like it never existed in the first place. I was immediately aware that the bliss had never left in the first place. It was only ignored so that I could focus on my story or the circumstances. It was absolutely magical. I realized that you could fuck up your whole life, but if you unconditionally accept everything with all of your heart, then everything is, repeated, is immediately replaced with love. Soon after this realization, I thought of my daughter's pain. Soon after this realization, I thought of my daughter again, and the pain was still there. I knew that I had to allow for this pain. So I decided to go inside the house so I could settle down for a serious session with this pain. I was reminded of something a mystic said about pain. He said that pain is awareness trying to express itself or something to the effect of awareness is always expanding and that we resist this expansion and that our pain is just the resistance to that expansion. So I lied on the couch and I went very deeply into my pain. I looked for it and I welcomed it to express itself as intensely as I wanted. Actually, I was really looking forward to experiencing some deep pain. I wanted nothing more than to feel the pain that I knew was there. The very act of allowing for the pain was immediately liberating and the pain was transformed into joy. As I allowed for the pain to express itself, I actually saw it, eyes closed, but I saw it, rising up out of my heart like a waveform and I felt like I was on a drug hallucinating all this. As the pain waveform rose up, joy filled my heart, and as it peaked, I shouted non-verbally, she's healed, picturing her with a healthy face. I went back to look for more pain and repeated this process four or more times until there was no more pain to be found. I knew at once that I discovered something very amazing. The mystics were right. Pain is just our resistance to the expansion of awareness. Awareness is impersonal, 
and it's its nature to expand. Allowing for this expansion manifests as bliss, and resisting this expansion manifests as suffering. The very next day, her scab had lifted a little under her eye, and what we saw underneath looked very healthy. I knew at that moment that she was healed, and even if she wasn't, I took comfort that whatever she was to suffer, it would be my suffering as we shared the same eye. The following day, we were playing rough on the couch, and a big piece of the scab fell off to reveal healthy and flat skin. My wife saw it and was amazed. She said that the doctors were going to be shocked that it healed so well and so fast. Um, so they, we went to the doctor. Oh, never mind. They told us that the skin may bubble up if the contusion was deep, and this would cause all kinds of complications. But her skin looked so well that my wife wondered if we still need to bother with the follow-up this Tuesday to the plastic surgeon. We will still go for the sake of following up, but today when she got home, the rest of her scalp was gone and had healed perfectly. Words cannot express just how much I appreciate my daughter's existence and all the joy that her companionship brings me. It has dawned on me that what all this is about, and it's not about enlightenment, awakening, liberation, or anything like that, Life is simply about allowing. To be allowing of everything is already to rest in peace. The spiritual path is about a new relationship to life. To live as an open channel so that life could freely move through you. To be open is to be loving. To be loving is to be allowing. The joy that has been expressing itself through me these last three weeks was nothing more in the expansion of impersonal awareness. The bliss is sure to pass as all things come to pass. But these various states of being are not what we are anyway. We are, or what we are, is the witness of these various states. We are the space for bliss. We are the space for suffering. To be the witness is to be loved. To be loved is to be open. The perfect expression of a true nature is to be nothing more than the allowing of what is. So then on 9-12-02 I write, We are all living in the midst of heaven, but each of us chooses to create a hell where there is none. Why? And I think I wrote this because I'm pretty sure after I wrote that last post, um, someone asked me, what about all the suffering? You know. You're describing everything so great, the whole world's joy, the whole world's bliss. You acknowledge suffering in the world. Explain it. So I'm pretty sure that this is my attempt to explain the suffering. All right, so 9.12.02 I write, We are all living in the midst of heaven, but each of us chooses to create a hell where there is none. Why? Because it is a habit. We choose the familiar pain of the world because the only other alternative is tantamount to death. The way out of the pain always involves an opening, and we take that opening to be our death. Because to us, the death of our ego is our own death. Pain is what happens when you resist what is. Pain is only experienced by the ego when it feels threatened. But peace is always available just create an open space for the pain, or more correctly, be the space for the pain. What that means is that if you falsely identify with that which is your ego, then you will surely suffer, but if you correctly identify with what you really are, which is simply the space for the pain, then you will observe the pain. If you really inspect the pain closely, something strange happens. You notice that it is merely a tension that undoes itself as you pay very close attention to your experience. Practically speaking, what does all this mean? Basically, it means that as the creators of our reality, each of us chooses moment by moment whether or not we will experience heaven or hell. A while back, I saw that our lives are much like a human hand in the sense that you are either in a state of openness, open palm, or a state of being closed, closed fist. An open hand is heaven because you are gesturing a trust and surrendering to reality. 
Whereas a closed fist is held because you're gesturing a defensive crouch in an effort to protect that which you identify with, whether it be your thoughts, your values, or your position. There is a Zen story that I always share with people to demonstrate how heaven or hell is always at our fingertips. It's about a man that goes to a Zen master and asks the Zen master to explain heaven and hell. The Zen master replies, I can't show you anything because you're too stupid to understand anything that I'm saying. Being offended, the man draws his sword and screams, I'll chop off your head for talking to me like that. To which the Zen master exclaims, there is hell. As the man realizes that the Zen master was just using insults to teach him, he bows before him, thanking him for the teaching. To this, the Zen master concludes, and there is heaven. I really love that story as it points out that heaven and hell are in the mind, or rather, the only states of mind. There is also a person, personal experience that I could draw on. One time I went to get something, or I was trying to do something very mundane. I don't even remember what it was, but whatever it was, I didn't get my way. Things did not go according, according to plan. <clears throat> my initial reaction was, ah. By the time I got the complaint out of my mouth, I recognized the opportunity and I seized it. It all happened in an instant, but talking about what happened will make it sound like a process that I went through. So I'll describe what happened in slow motion. The memory of it is as it is kicked in and I automatically opened my palm. As I opened up, a wonderful wave of peace rushed over me that was not there previous to the whole event. It was very impressive. I went from a state of inattentive awareness to angry to conscious awareness in a matter of seconds. I was blown away because it was a micro version of the big picture. On a cosmic level, we go from a state of unconscious awareness to conscious suffering to conscious awareness. That is the benefit of the illusion of separation. It propels us to conscious awareness. The moment of resistance and suffering on my part offered me an opportunity to open up. The energy that was anger was transformed into joy by the simple act of opening up to what actually is. I thought I made a radical discovery. I quickly started writing down that pain is good. Suffering is good. If your agenda is to open up and experience being, then everything is seen as an opportunity and pain is the greatest opportunity of all because its ability to act as an impetus to joy. I saw that everything leads to heaven. Everything we see and everything we feel is actually a doorway to the infinite if we just stay with what is. So there you have it. The question remains, why do we choose pain? Every man must answer this for himself. The toughest part of all of this is that we always feel so justified in holding on to our pain. But I was wrong, damn it. I should be mad. I have every right to be in pain. Look what they did to me. You can justify your anger all you want, but the fact remains that what is still is. So I ask, why add pain to what already is? In other words, you already got screwed once. Why screw yourself again? The only reason you could justify adding pain to anything is self-righteousness. Instead, take the opportunity to practice. Each moment is an opportunity to practice mindfulness. I saw the whole thing like a game. Problems are like little energy packets that provide the opportunity for loving energy. So those who are in most need of this energy will have more problems than the man who already has a decent amount of love energy. Of course, the needy man will take this as a curse, but that is only his negative perception. It is really the universe extending forth that much more opportunity for love energy. So it is up to us what we do with that energy. Only we make good or bad. After this experience, I was so blown away that I literally couldn't wait for my next problem. 
I couldn't wait for what used to be suffering. So 9.14, I continue. <clears throat> um, and I guarantee you, this was a reaction to uh, what I just wrote. Um, I What I just wrote, someone reacted. Um, I don't know. I don't remember. We'll see what the criticism is, but I'm sure they're saying I'm being too blasé about the pain or I'm making a misunderstanding. So this post is me trying to clarify what I just said. So 9.14.02, I write, A couple of days ago, I referred to Buddha saying something to the... A couple of days ago, I referred to Buddha saying something to the effect of Nirvana is the cessation of suffering. In the same paragraph that I used that Buddha quote, I also referred to him teaching joyful participation in the sorrows of life. And that, by the way, is my favorite. I'll never come up with something more beautiful and more complete than joyful participation in the sorrows of life. That's it. These two teachings may sound contradictory. Nirvana is the cessation of suffering and joyful participation in the sorrows of life. These two teachings may sound contradictory, but again, it is only because of the inherent limitation in language. It has come to my attention that we should make a distinction between pain and suffering when talking about these matters. Pain referring to the sorrows of life that inevit inevitably arise because of the nature of duality, such as your tooth surgery or the loss of a loved one. Suffering would refer to the resistance of what is, such as the pain resulting from injury or loss. I make this distinction be because pain is direct, it's immediate, independent of thinking. Whereas suffering is only a result of thinking. A couple of months ago, we got hit hard with a lot of unexpected bills and other problems that were very overwhelming. It all came on like an avalanche, and the topper was that I thought my driver's license was suspended for missing a court date for a speeding ticket. After that final blow, I went out and I sat on my sat out on my porch as I always do at night. My mind felt too restless to meditate, so I just sat with all the problems and noticed the heaviness associated with them. As I began to associate with the heaviness, the mind kicked in as the problem solved. Almost immediately I realized there was no suffering until my mind jumped up to solve the problem. Now I was suffering, but it was not because of my situation. Instead, it was because of my resistance to my situation. It occurred to me that without thinking, there is no problem. There is no suffering. The mind, or thinking itself, acts as the problem solver. So, it generates these fictional problems and employs itself as a problem solver to solve its own generated problems. It occurred to me that I was aware of the situation for some time, but it was only when I thought about it that I suffered or perceived a problem. In other words, I knew I had the speeding ticket or the, you know, the problem with the D, D, DMV, but it was only when I thought about it that I was suffering. The problem was there the whole time, but it was only when I was thinking about it, bringing it into my mind that I was suffering. Uh, okay. In a flash, it dawned on me that all that was actually happening was that one day, instead of looking at the trees or my living room, I'd be looking at the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's it. Instead of me giving my money to someone else, I'd be giving it to them. Instead of spending X amount of money on food, entertainment, etc., I'd be spending a less amount. There was no problem at all and no suffering at all except for the thinking about my situation. No thinking equals no problem. No thinking equals no suffering. If we allow for the pain that arises out of our circumstances, then this pain does not have to become suffering. If our tooth hurts and you allow for the pain, then there is no suffering, only the awareness of pain. If your tooth hurts and you resist the pain, then now there is pain and suffering. A life free of pain may not be possible, is impossible. Then there is now, if, okay. If your, if your tooth hurts and you allow for the pain, then there is no suffering, only the awareness of pain. If your tooth hurts and you resist the pain, 
then there is now pain and suffering. A life free of pain may not be possible or even desirable, but a life free of cer suffering certainly is. What is even more beautiful about all this is that even if you find yourself unnecessarily suffering, the mere recognition of this suffering liberates you immediately. I can think of nothing more liberating than the immediate realization of recognition. I'm sorry. I can think of nothing more liberating than the immediate realization or recognition of your own mistakes. So true. My greatest pleasure is the bittersweet. I love the love that I have for my wife and daughter tastes best when I am acutely aware of their inevitable demise, death. Taking into consideration that they or I will eventually die flavors the love with something so real and so honest that even the ability to love is appreciated itself. One of my favorite offerings of this world is music. I find it, I, I find ceaseless joy in bittersweet music. I always find myself at odds in the car because my daughter complains that my music selections are too sad and the same songs give my wife a weird vibe. I agree that my favorite songs could be described as sad, but it is such an honest sadness that this opening makes way for a joy that appreciates the beauty of impermanence. It is almost as if the songs are a joyful celebration of the sadness in life. Over the next month or so, I would receive a lesson regarding the bittersweet in the form of finding our dream home. For the last two or three years, my wife and parents had tried to convince me to buy a house, but I did not even want to think about it, as I knew it re would require a mindset that was at odds with my spiritual pursuit. But two weeks after my experience of enlightenment, my family visited for Labor Day weekend, and this time when the topic came up, I shocked everyone by casually responding, sure, why not? I got nothing better to do. Let's go buy a house. <laughs> so we looked at homes, list, we looked at home, home listings over the month of September, but didn't find anything that interested us. Mountain views were the top priority for both my wife and I. Aside from that, the only other thing that we were looking for was a little acreage so that we could have some wilderness to explore without having to get in the car. We had already fallen in love with Nelson County, Virginia, where we had been renting a house for the last three years, so that is the only area we even considered. When I told the real estate agents what I was looking for and that I couldn't afford anything more than a hundred grand, they all laughed at me. But after a little research on the internet, I found the only house that we would ever look at. I never, I never looked at any other house but the house we ended up moving in. This was just a vacation home for a wealthy businessman who was actually just leveraging, leveraging the house for a bankruptcy case that he tried to take back. And I just happened to waltz in at just the right time to be the lucky beneficiary to scoop it up for just over a hundred grand. All the coincidences that had to line up just perfectly to make this possible are absolutely staggering. The whole thing seemed like a lucid dream. When I was at the Monroe Institute, one of the things that we did was to create a visualization of a peaceful place that you could return to after each exploratory session. Uh, and the location of the house looked exactly like the place that I had created in my imagination, in my visualization of my perfect place. When I told this to my wife, she showed me a piece of paper that she had been keeping over the years, which was a detailed description of her dream house, and it also described this house perfectly. It is a small, very small, two-bedroom house with debt two decks on both floors overlooking, overlooking the most gorgeous view of the Blue Ridge Mountains that I've ever seen from any home. The house sits atop the first foothill of the mountain chain on seven acres of untamed forest and at the bottom of our property is the Piney River. A few miles down from the Piney River are your, and you're in the National Forest where you'll find the Crabtree Falls, 
which is the highest cascading waterfall east of the Mississippi. Within a 20 minute drive, you could be at Wintergreen Ski Resort, the Blue Ridge Parkway, several entrances to the Appalachian Trail, and countless gorgeous nooks along the many rivers that surround the area. The reason that I'm taking so much time to describe the beauty of the area is to give you some sense of just how hooked I was, how attached I was to this house. After my experience of enlightenment, I would experience both ends of the spectrum in, ter in terms of fortune. The horrible end was when my da daughter burned her eye, and the wonderful end was the discovery of her dream home. One would assume that it would be a lot easier to abide in presence while experiencing good fortune than bad, but in my case, the opposite would be true. When my daughter was hurt, this was so painful that it was almost easy to be present because the situation was so intense and the feelings were so raw and palpable that you really couldn't help but be prepared for very bad feelings. You're in the shit. You're prepared for shit. But this thing with the house was so sneaky because it was disguised as great news. So it was a lot easier to get swept away with my feelings before realizing that I have fallen into a spell of deep identification. After the long and complicated process of actually buying the house, I felt like I needed a rest from all the attachment that I had noticed regarding my new paradise. We moved in a week before Thanksgiving and I would spend the rest of the winter recuperating from last year's events culminating with the appearance of our dream house that we are now living in. To say that everything seemed like a lucid dream would actually be an understatement. Everything was working out so perfectly that it was downright creepy. I think that it was around this time I couldn't even look at my writings anymore. I didn't want to think about my life or about life in general. And if friends or family ever brought up anything deep, I would shy away from it, as the subject of anything deep just seemed too overwhelming to even approach. Unable to read or write about anything meaningful, I hibernated over the winter. Nearly six months after my last journal entry, I finally broke my silence. So on 3-3-3, March 3rd, 2003, I wrote, A sense of grace has arisen from the stillness and shined, bright, and shined itself brightly upon my life. Hmm. It's too difficult to pinpoint the exact day, but it was, an, it, it was an abrupt showing as it was simply waiting for me one day upon waking. Just like that. I knew what was back. It has waxed and waned in its intensity, but ultimately it has been expanding with the passing of time. The winter months have been a time of rest for me, and this was greatly enjoyed as last year was nothing short of amazingly exciting. See, I told you I'm not a writer. Amazingly exciting. I'll come up with a better one. All right. I still haven't reflected fully on last year's extraordinary events, which culminated in the bridging of heaven and earth. It's too weird to reflect on, as it seems unbelievable in so many ways that the mere thinking about the synchronicities that colored 2002 is enough to literally freeze any and all thinking. Even as I write this now, I do so only because of today's date and its symbolism of the triunity. Remember, the date is 333, March 3rd, 2003. The truth is that I'd rather not write at all, but instead just be. I have willed myself to write this now because the idea of regularly writing has become attractive lately. Waves of loving energy have been rushing through me so much that I want nothing more than to share this by letting it pass through me. Many wonderful visions and such appear with such clarity that I don't even think to remember them, as they appear as eternal truths that are so obvious that they need not be committed to memory. Yet it seems that this wisdom passes 
as the wave itself passes. In the throes of the wave, the eternal wisdom is so much a part of you that it is almost taken for granted. But as the wave crests and collapses under its own weight, it becomes obvious that if this truth is not recorded while the momentum is there, it will only exist as a dim memory of something extraordinary, yet simply ordinary. I would like to serve as a vessel for this energy, so I will record what comes up for me in these days of expansion. The period of contraction that started with the acquisition of our dream home lasted all of about two months starting roughly after Thanksgiving. What was different about this phase of contraction was that I just didn't care whether I was feeling it or not. I saw that I am that. And that is the truth that I live from. So the moving mind was seen to be no different than the still mind. I want to read that again. I saw that I am that. And the truth is that I live. And the truth, I saw that I am that, and that is the truth that I live from. So the moving mind was seen to be no different than the still mind. It's the same mind. I knew what I ultimately was, so I just enjoyed the period of rest for what it was. There is something very liberating about not having to do anything or work on anything anymore. True liberation is knowing that you are already complete with nothing to strive for. Right now is what it is all about. Already enlightened, no realization to attain, no bondage to liberate yourself from, no one to wake, just this. So I continue on 3803. I write, words are spoken, but there is no speaker. Isn't that the miracle that provides the greatest joy? My God, nothing has ever existed, yet words appear from this void, for no one to hear them. But who should this make sense to? The functioning of the mind, which you know is little more than a process or an aggregate, is to make sense. But when identification is no longer directing the mind, then the mind seems too weak or unanimated to even try to make sense anymore. What I found was that the mind is constantly engaged with maintaining the house of cards that I call Mark. But after Mark was revealed as a fraud, it seemed that the motive for sustaining, for sustaining this hollow pseudo entity no longer existed. If awareness in the form of constant attention or identification does not enliven or illuminate the pseudo-identity entity, then it, Mark, functions as nothing more than a part of the scenery for the witness. And that's what I meant before, where we're the space even for the identification. You're the space for the movement, you're the space for the identification, you're the space for everything. Everything that possibly happened, ignorance, you're the space for that. After a moment of inquiry, all that could be found was who cares. And this was not an emphasis on the who of who cares, but more like why engage the mind with imaginary problems when liberation is always available in a state of rest. All of this is so impersonal. The momentum of the ego drives us to keep in perpetual motion. There is nothing that actually cares about the relationship between the one and the many, or who it is that wants enlightenment. All of this is just a particular manifestation of the momentum of mind sustaining itself with the fire of your attention. As long as the fire is fueled by identification with these thoughts and questions, they will continue to appear in different forms, if only to obscure the inherent emptiness that is what you actually are. I find the greatest joy in witnessing appearances, Mark, the world, etc., spontaneously arising from this void. Nothing has ever existed, but look around and behold the majesty of your imagination. From the pure stillness of the void, 
You are the sole witness of this. Fucking A. What is there to seek? Where is the bondage? Who is there to do anything anyways? And the last one I wrote on 517.03 for this chapter uh, was written because someone asked, if you live from stillness, how will things get done? So if you live from this place of stillness, how, are, how is anything going to get done? So 517.03, I write, when you do give up the illusory sense of control of your life, you see that things do happen on their own and perfectly so. When your bladder is full, it will automatically signal that it needs to be relieved. When you, know, you find your body automatically squirming and walking to the proper facility. When cars come and honk, your body automatically moves out of the way. When you wake up, you find that your body automatically getting ready for work. You've never done anything your whole life anyways. So this is really just giving up the illusory sense of being a thing among other things. To be truly free is to give up the struggle with what is. And that's it, folks. That's it for the first chapter. Uh, I appreciate you uh, hanging with me. And if you have any questions about that, post them on YouTube, and I'll get right back to you. And um, I'm going to get back to you as soon as I can, definitely within a week, hopefully sooner. I, you know, um, uh, I, I say I'll do these once a week, but I'm hoping to do them a lot more than once a week. I just want to set the expectations at a week, but I'm going to try to do them as often as possible. So um, I'm going to work on Chapter 2 and get it back to you as soon as possible. Until then, have a great day. Bye.